Romans 6. All believers are dead to sin. Now, this chapter is outstanding in understanding our union with Christ. In understand our being justified by Christ and our being sanctified with Christ. Outstanding in understanding that if we are like Christ in our death to this world, then we shall be like him in our resurrection to the next world. Now, in this chapter, believers are told to consider themselves dead to sin. In verse 11, as Jesus was dead to sin. Now, how dead to sin we are, actually, we will examine that controversy in the next chapter. But, for now, we are told that there certainly is some death to our sinfulness. And that we should not continue in sin so that allegedly God's amazing grace will be all the more magnified. Paul is aghast at such a foolish belief, saying, God forbid, that's a belief for unbelievers. And he starts the chapter with that nasty reprimand. Then he develops his thesis, and then he repeats that nasty reprimand towards the end of this chapter, verse 15. Now, it's fascinating that such a warped sense of grace of Christ has evolved so fast in Paul's time. On the surface, it sounds like a silly belief that God's amazing grace will be all the more magnified by our increase in sin. A silly belief. Yet, it's still believed by many that call themselves Christian in our time. Those that believe that grace has replaced the law of God. Now, so let's do a case study on this warped sense of grace. Let's look at some slack and spurious Christians which Paul may have had in mind when he penned this chapter. After all, he was... Speaking of using members of your body in a non-viable way, in verse 13. Specifically, let's look at those that call themselves Christian homosexuals, as an example. Yes? Those shallow thinkers and unnatural doers were around in Paul's time, too. So, in, in Rome and as well as Corinth. Now, many Christian homosexuals believe that the death of Christ abolished the actual sin of homosexuality. They believe that those archaic laws are now done away with by Jesus, and that they can now actively engage in monogamous sex with their own gender, to the glory of the grace of God. However, only 1% of gays are actually monogamous. But they strangely believe that, according to Paul, in Romans chapter 1, verse 26, and 1 Corinthians 6, verse 11, that homosexuals are not, are they, they're merely not allowed to engage in heterosexual behavior now. <laughs> well, most homosexuals do that do that at the same time as well. Maybe. But they believe that they're not allowed because they were just not born that way. Like Lady Gaga says. Not allowed because engaging in heterosexual behavior would betray their true identity of homosexual. However, according to Paul, Sinful lusts continue to exist in us and will remain our identity until our ultimate death. That's referred to in verse 12 and in the next chapter as well. And that contrary to the wishful thinking of Christian homosexuals, Paul insists that those moral laws revealed by God remain in effect. And that such wishful thinkers are merely being wistful. 
and that their immorality has dire consequences. But those folks strangely think since they were born that way, since they were allegedly born with those uncommon lusts that must not be immoral. They think that all intrinsic lusts are moral if you were born with them. After all, God doesn't make junk, does he? Well, hmm. we will see that he actually does in chapter 9. Yeah, Paul implores these people not to let such illicit lust reign in their bodies. Again, there's also such a thing as licit lust, but this is illicit lust. Paul insists that those who do let such illicit lust reign in their bodies are truly slaves of sin, that they are truly slaves of unrighteousness. Again, that term means that that term means that they are truly as good as. Paul insists again and again that those slaves of sin must have true union with Christ, that they must be baptized into Jesus' death, that they must have their lack of discipline put to death and be truly born again. Now, verse 20, on a different topic. Verse 20 is a little confusing. It says, when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What kind of double speak is this, you ask? Well, when you were a slave, there was no obligation to exercise your freedom because you were a slave. Your freedom did not exist. So you were free of that obligation. So Paul continues, but now... You who are true Christians actually have the benefit of freedom. And now you are compelled to exercise that freedom by being obedient to that law of God. That now God will actually render good stuff to you according to your good deeds. Because your deeds look like his deeds. And our sanctification, well, <laughs> that is the good stuff gotten from good deeds. Now, some folks say that sanctification is the very same thing as justification because it's not actually listed separately in Paul's golden chain of redemption. That order of salvation that is presented to Paul presents in chapter 8. And at the other extreme, Rome would say that there is only sanctification and no justification. That you may or not be saved, may or may not be saved after your good deeds have been tested by fire. However, I would agree with recent award winning author Constantine Campbell that they are co terminus, which means that justification and sanctification start at the very same time, yet they are not the same. Campbell is a specialist in Greek verbal aspect, and he would say that, and he's probably piggybacking on McMaster Greek specialist Stanley, Stanley Porter again, he would say that sanctification is an extension of that aspect of justification. In other words, sanctification goes beyond justification. Both are an aspect of our glorification with Christ, yet sanctification has a wider aspect than justification. It describes our quality of eternal life. Remember, our quantity has already been fixed by our justification of Christ. In the Hebrew, this sanctification is known as holiness or brightness. Indeed, this is where the eternal rewards fit in. This is where the eternal benefits fit in. And what that benefit is what? What is it? Well, it's better union with Christ. Indeed, better union with Christ through better obedience to his moral law. Now, does that motivate you? 
Or would you rather have a law born of wistful thinking? God forbid. May never be. Amen.